Hey everyone, I'm Mike Patty with Cine Samples and Hollywood Scoring, and uh, in this video series, we're kind of uh, interviewing uh, some of our friends from the musician uh, community here in Los Angeles, and uh, and today we're going to discuss one of the most popular instruments for film score composers, and that's the French horn. Uh, and we're here with Dylan Hart. Hey, how's hey, it going? Hey, Dylan. Thanks for for doing this. Thanks for having me. So why don't we just jump right into it? Um, I first want to get into talking about the ranges of the instrument. Okay. Um, well, the range of the instrument is from uh, from pedal B flat. Uh, it's it's three and a half off three and a half octaves from pedal B flat all the way up to um, a high F, um, and the F is at the top of the treble clef staff. Okay. Um, so as French horn players, we transpose. So it can get a little confusing, but in Los Angeles, all French horn players just talk in concert pitch. Whatever pitch that you're going to be writing it down in, uh, just, just, meant, okay. just say it like that because it's easier than everybody else in the room can understand what pitches we're talking about and they don't have to be like, oh, should I transpose to this if this is the chord? And right, right. It's just easier that we talk in concert pitch. All right, can you so, do just a quick like... Uh, yeah, so from the from pedal, all the way through the range. And some people can play higher. Really? So, so that's uh, yeah. what, A flat? And that's a, a B flat. B flat. So, so you know, it's a full four octaves, okay. but um, but don't go past the F. Generally, generally you don't right. go past the F. Okay, unless you have Dylan. Uh, well, <laughs> well, it goes into a. We have a separate instrument if it goes past the F okay. um, that we can talk about a little bit. All right. So in um, the orchestration books, and well, if you look at like old uh, Beethoven scores, mm -hmm. you know they have different types of horns for the different sections. You get horn and F, right. horn and C. Uh, does that apply today, or what, what does that mean? Well, and originally the French horn didn't have any valves. Originally, no instruments had valves. Essentially, it was just a hose wrapped around itself and then a yeah. funnel at the end. And so the only notes we could play are the notes that appear on the harmonic series. As you can tell, that was a B flat. That's or, there's an F. That was so an that's F. on the right. F harmonic series. Okay. So as you can tell, there's some notes missing. If I wanted to play a scale, yeah. It's not. You're missing. Yeah, yeah, missing a couple notes. And so what we did is we got around that by using our hand. So we can use our hand in the bell to change the pitch. If I put my hand here, so we could play a full scale. Gotcha. Yeah. So, <laughs> thankfully, you don't have to do that. Yeah, anymore. thankfully, we don't have to do that anymore. We have valves, which are great. And so, the way that in um, the old scores they would they would have horns in F and horns in E flat because. Mm -hmm. Uh, you would have to take out a piece of the horn and put a new piece in, and those were called crooks. We have our tuning slides now, but you would okay. have to take out a crook and make the horn longer so that it, you could play these notes. And use your hand to adjust from there. I see, all right. So what happened with the advent of valves is instead of having to take out crooks and put crooks in to make the horn longer or shorter so you can get the different notes in the different overtone series, is we just press a button and it adds the amount that the crook would ha have added if we were taking it out and putting it back in. Gotcha. Okay. So essentially, and all instruments, all brass instruments are the same, is it's just um, several different instruments layered on top of itself and we're just playing on the different overtone series of each of the instruments to make up all of the notes in a given scale. Got it. That was very clear. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so as far as transposition of the instrument, how do Right, well, that work. well, back when we didn't have valves, when uh, there would be a horn in C and a horn in E flat, yeah. you just read it like it's on the page. Um, and you just change where you heard the fundamental pitch in your ear, 
and then you just had the same hand positions or fingerings um, right. that you would have for anything. You never transposed. Now, because we don't change the fundamental of the instrument, essentially we use our fingers, um, we have to move the notes in our head. Okay. So when we see uh, a written F on the paper, um, if that is in concert score, then we will play a C for our instrument. So we're a fifth away. Okay. Um, we play a fifth up. But if we're transposing in an orchestra, we usually transpose, we usually transpose down. Okay. So if it says horn in D, that is two steps below F, because this is a horn in F, and we just read horn in F. So um, when it says horn in D, I have to take everything down two steps, or two half steps. Mm. Uh, no, two, yeah, two full steps in order to get to the note that I should be playing. Gotcha. All right. That, that should be very clear. Yes, that was less clear than the first answer. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, but aren't there, uh, like, specialists, though, in, in the horn? There's, there's the high specialists, right, and then the low well, the Especially horn encompasses such a large range yeah. um, that there are people who play, who call themselves high horn players and generally play the high stuff really well, and there are mm -hmm. people who call themselves low horn players and generally play the low stuff really well, because it's very difficult to get all of the instrument as the same loudness and okay. quality and you know ability level. Even the best players in the world generally we'll either play high horn or low horn. Okay. And we, I can play everything on the instrument, but it is easiest for me to play a high horn, the high, high horn stuff. Okay, uh, gotcha. As, as orchestrators, uh, the way they, I guess, are used to train, at least in the books, the old Adler books and stuff, it would say if there's four horns, you kind of go one, three, two, four. Or is it, no, it's one, yeah. three, two, four, like that. Right. Uh, well, is that still... Yeah, in you know. orchestras, they generally have the first and third horn are the high horns, and the second and fourth horns are the low horns. Okay. And this goes back to the transposition days. Back when Brahms would be writing, he would be writing first and second horns in C, and third and fourth horns in E flat. So there would essentially be two sections. And so first horn would have a bunch of solos, mm -hmm. and third horn would have a bunch of solos, because it's covering a different set of pitches. Okay. So it turns out that the first horn and the third horn were the high horn players, and the second horn and the fourth horn were the low horn players. But in Los Angeles, in the studio world, you just, you just play straight down. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Sometimes we'll see uh, one, three, five, seven be the high parts, and two, four, six, eight be low parts. Um, but generally, it just goes down to the line. The first two are high, the second two are lower, the third, you know. Got it. And then how are you sitting? Is it the same? One, two, three, four, five, six? Yeah, it always goes one, two, three, four, five, six to our right because our bell is in the ear of the person not below us, but the next yeah. chair. Okay. So first horn is all the way on the left, and then the next horn is next to that, and then third yeah. horn after that, and fourth horn, and so on. Okay. Um, what are some of the, you know, well, you went through the range, uh, but maybe talk a little bit about the dynamics of each of the range and what are things to watch out for. You can't okay. play piano in certain ranges. And so the, um, above, above the staff, it becomes much more difficult to attack softly. We can play lyrical lines, we can play melodical lines, but if you want us to come in on a high note softly, and this goes for any brass instrument, it gets really difficult because of the speed of air we have to use in order to play in that register, mm -hmm. it becomes difficult to play super soft. Um, for French horns, we have... Um, we can get our most amount of power uh, from uh, the C, like middle C or, or B flat below the staff. Okay. Um, and this is written for you guys uh, to uh, maybe the B flat or C above that. And then you know we can Got blast up, we can blast up high, but generally it, when you go lower than than here, lower than middle C, lower than yeah than the B flat it. You can still play loud, but it's you can't get quite the power. Okay. And then you actually run into some articulation problems, and so um, because it makes it harder to get a note to speak really clearly. Okay. So that's why we like to play Wagner tuba in that register because it just it's more clear. It'll give you the aggression you want, 
and um, it's easier for us to play loud. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's the one thing I wanted to talk about with the trumpet. We didn't get a chance to is talk I mean, about tonguing techniques mm -hmm. and things that you often see, double tonguing and, and, and how easy it is depending on the right. range. So uh, whenever you're in your normal range, in your, your good register for the French horn, um, tonguing is not an issue. When you get extremely low, very fast tonguing becomes very difficult. So if you're trying to get... Um, Let's hear yeah, Let's so. see you screw up. <laughs> That's single tonguing, and then there's yeah. double tonguing, which I, I say, it's like saying kitty. Okay. Like saying here, kitty, 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 kitty. That's what we do. And then there's triple tonguing. Mm -hmm. So if you have something that is in triplets or in sextuplets or something like that, we can mm -hmm. go da di ga. Okay. But as we go lower, Okay. Okay. It gets more and more difficult the so lower you go. I would assume then you should avoid even writing fast, kind of repeating choral write, chor chordal writing that has staccato yeah, stuff. Yeah, super or, repeated staccato stuff. Yeah. Uh, in the low register is better on the Wagner tuba. Okay. Um, because it'll speak, it'll speak easier or trombone. All right. Well, let's pull out the Wagner tuba. Okay. So when would you, so you would kind of just answered that already. Right, so, um, so in that register, so. It's like more piercing. Right, kind. exactly. So it's a lot easier for us to get the aggression that you want. If you keep saying, oh, French horns, it's not enough, or uh, it's just, it's a little too muddy in the articulation, then you go to this. Okay, all right. And who would make, you would just make that suggestion on the stand, like, hey, um, no, hey, let's yeah, try. Yeah, we'll make it on the stand. Everybody in LA has one of these. Okay. Um, this is one of our um, doubling instruments, and we'll either make it on the stand, but a lot of times, it's told to us beforehand that yeah. they're going to write for Wagner tuba. You're going to have some Wagner tuba stuff, like the right. universal theme, bum 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 bum. Uh -huh. It's eight French horns, and then the second one, bum 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 bum. Yeah, bum, yeah. Bum, The answer is eight Wagner tubas. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and then when they the whole theme at the end is all sixteen playing. Gotcha. Did you play on the uh, yeah. the re-recording? Yeah, that was awesome. really fun. Because that was yeah, they're they're kind of across the room from you each got, other. Yeah. Yeah, you got the eight over here. And cool. Um, all right, well, I guess along those lines, what were some of your favorite sessions that you've played on? Uh, I give you permission to name drop. Okay. <laughs> um, I've been really very fortunate in my uh, career to have been able to play for all of the really great composers. Um, and, you know, some of my very favorite things, I remember saying to myself, I need to, I need to play for John Williams before I die. And... <laughs> And uh, I got to play on, on a cleanup session for War Horse, and I got to play on one session for Book Thief. Um, so awesome. those were really, really amazing. But I think um, one of my favorites of recent memory was playing Godzilla for Desplat, the new oh, Godzilla cool. movie coming yeah. out. That because was a big he, orchestra. It was a huge orchestra, and the setup was really interesting because he had trumpets, uh, trombones, and tuba, and then French horns. This was at Sony, so this was going around the room, and then there were woodwinds, and then there were another set of French horns, tuba, trombones, and trumpets. Oh, that's cool. So it was two entire antiphonal brass sections, and he used French horns and Wagner tubas to get all these very cool effects. It was really fun. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Nice. All right, well, um, I don't know. We should talk about mutes? Let, yes, mutes. So, uh, yeah, let's hear the regular... What's the other horn there you got? Is that so just... this is actually a descant horn for um, what I was saying when we go above concert F. Um, they make these horns, which are actually half size of the regular French horn. So when you get high. It doesn't, it sounds much easier and you can go up higher than, than the F. Okay. The solo in um, Prometheus was done on a mm. descant horn because it goes up to a high G. Okay. 
right? It goes yeah, up yeah, to yeah. A, it goes up to a G. So uh, and that's another case where you'll just kind that's of make where the, we would we would do descant. Anything right. above an F, we're gonna pull out a descant for. Okay, and then you'll just make that judgment. Right. Okay. Exactly. All right. So let's uh, talk about some of the mutes you got. Okay. So um, when you when you write mute for French horn, yeah. this is what we're gonna pick up. Um, I have seen written wood mute or fiber mute, uh, but it's all the same. It's all the same. Yeah. This is essentially cardboard covered in wood with a wood bottom um, to it, and they all sound very similar. Trumpet uh, trumpet players have, you know, straight mutes, and they have five different kinds of straight mutes that all sound different, and they mm -hmm. all bring them, and they have cup mutes and all these different mutes, and French horn players just bring one mute. Yeah. And if you say mute, they, you get one mute. <laughs> They're not going to bring five different straight mutes and be like, oh, what about the sound of this one? And not everybody gets the same mute. It's just a, it's just, yeah. it's a communal, I guess it's a community thing or however it is. But so this is the sound of the open French horn. And this is muted. So it's like it's thinner and it's it's a little quieter. it's definitely softer. It's yeah. more of a softness than a color change for us. Mm -hmm. um, and but the other mute we have is called a metal mute. Right. And this is actually what we use for stopped horn. Um, so stopped horn is um, is essentially when we put our hand in the bell and make a raspy sound. Mm -hmm. So that's putting my hands in the bell and then completely closing it so that the it bends down and then the pitch actually jumps up a half step for us. Ah, okay, yeah. So you have to read or you have to transpose. So we have to transpose. Head. When when we see stopped horn, which is means there's a plus over the note, yeah. Um, then we have to transpose down a half step in our head yeah. and play on a different side of the horn because pitch gets all weird. Oh jeez. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you do that with your hand, you get the stopped. But so you, then, we do that with our hand to get the stopped. And then this but this does, mute actually does the exact same thing. Um, it accomplishes the same thing. It takes it down a half step and gives it that, that raspy, or sorry, it takes it up a half step and gives it the raspy sound. But it's just a little louder, and especially for low stuff, it's very difficult to stop low. Horn. Okay. Um, <laughs> I have to really jam my hand in there. Yeah. But if I use a stop mute, it makes playing low a lot easier stopped. Mm. It's a lot less effort. Um, it's a, yeah, it's a lot brighter. Yeah, it's, so if you want a stop mute, you can either, you want to write metal mutes. So metal mutes to us means stop mute. It doesn't mean a metal straight mute. Got it. it means okay. So by mute. default, if you just saw a plus, if, it, if it's a plus, we're just going to use our hands, use your hand. All right. unless it's really low, um, or if there's if there's a lot of time in between playing all the stop stuff and playing open stuff, that we can pick up a mute, put it in, take it out, and put it down before we have to play again. Okay. But I mean, we can go between stopped horn and uh, not stopped horn, you know, within the same measure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So composers nowadays, we all know they use samples. That's like 98% of the music we all hear <laughs> yeah. is guys sitting in front of their computers cranking out this annoying right. sounding music. No. Now, um, the result of that is that uh, we've come so used to hearing this sampled orchestra sound, which is basically the equivalent of a million piece orchestra or, you know, 2,000 players. You play right. a chord, it's, you know, it's... 27 a, French horns on the same note. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, one of the difficulties, the difficulties in trying to imitate that is that the sample sound is generally used in a very aggressive manner. And so we have to blow really loud and edgy in order to get that tone. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times samples are mixed between some stopped horn and some open horn in order to get the right color, right? Yeah, yeah. 
So, so, I mean, you've been in that situation before, probably, where someone's coming out on the stage and like, it doesn't sound big enough, right? Or right. what is the solution that you guys have offered? And Well, if that's the case, then uh, we'll offer to Stripe. Um, so okay. we'll, we'll play separately from everybody else. So we can play loud, and then you guys can turn us up if you want more French horn. Mm. Or you can do a double pass if you don't have enough horns to get the depth. Yeah. So if you have four horns, you can do four horns and then have them play it again. Right. Another four horns, do an overdub. Well, I know the thing that we, we've done on, on some of the League of Legends stuff mm -hmm. is we would do the horns and then mix them with the samples. Right. That way you get the realism of the actual real mm -hmm. performance with the body of the right. samples. Right. Hans Zimmer does that a lot. He'll use okay. 12 horns on a score and then add another 12 to 24 sampled horns yeah. underneath it. Uh, I think we did that with Superman. Okay. Um, so when we recorded that, it was no trumpets. It was just, it was nine trombones, I think, and six French horns. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we just, we played as loud as we could and then they added some samples underneath us to, to boost it to way they, what they wanted. One of the things that the samples does, for, uh, does against us is that the French horn has a very nice mellow sound, and samples tend to be more aggressive. Mm. So, I mean, if we're playing... Um, uh, right, we have to really push to get uh, yeah. an aggressive sound to get close to what the samples where we want to do is we want to play a little more broad. Well, I, that's, that's interesting because one of the biggest issues that I hear with, with composers' mock-ups is they, you know, uh, if I can get some nerd talk here, on Please. CC1 is the, is the controller for controlling the dynamic, the uh -huh. timbre. Um, and a lot of people use too much of that. So you're, you're up in this upper, really, you know, double to triple forte range, and then you'll have the volume down kind of low. So it's yeah. almost as impossible to produce sound. It's a very, yeah, very difficult. But if you really want that big sound, it should, I would guess, be the opposite. Have yeah. less of that buzzy triple forte and more just boost the volume. That actually brings up a really good point of something that we have to deal with is they want because what you said on the CC1, they turn it way up and then bring the volume down. So they're like, ah, French horns is too much, but we want it brighter. We want more edge, but don't play so loud. Yeah, and we're yeah. like, uh, you can't do that. Yeah. Um, so, so that is something that you should consider uh, when, when you know, miking real French horns or maybe doing your samples. Maybe just you know, appreciate what the instrument actually does. So when we're communicating with the horn section, um, and we want to have sort of the, that sort of piercing, brassy sound versus a, a warmer. I mean, what's what's the terminology that's the quickest? So term? we use we use kind of the term bright and dark. So uh, dark means no edge, bright means edge. And if you wanted something loud but without all the edge to it, you would say, oh, can you make it more noble? Can you make it more round? Or if you wanted something with more edge to it, uh, they would say, can you make it more brassy? Mm. Um, brassy to us means edge. So okay. you, you say, uh, I need that more brassy, a little less loud, but definitely keep the, keep the brassiness to it. And okay. Or you could just say either bright or dark. Bright, yeah. It needs to be a little brighter. But some, yeah. some conductors on the stand tend to say, oh, that's bright, and they're talking about pitch. So, okay. yeah, yeah, so yeah. It, all these terms kind of overlap. So brassy or not brassy, you know, is kind of your go-to phrase for us. Okay. Um, all right, general sort of uh, scoring session protocol. So say we're doing, you know, another take. Um, what are some of the terms that you guys like to hear uh, from the conductor or from the booth to, you know, like if... Right. So if we're doing another take, we like to know why. Yeah, yeah. Because sometimes we'll do five takes in a row, and they'll just keep saying, okay, we're doing another one. And if you don't tell us to do anything different, we'll play the exact same way. I mean, obviously, if there's like a big clam in it, you know, somebody makes a mistake, then we know what we're going for. But if we play it and it's fine, we're, we're going to want to know why you want to do it again so we can make the change right. so we can give you what you want. 
Because we can make whatever change you want, but if you don't tell us, if you're like, uh, I really need the balance to be different, say, oh, I need the balance to be different. Or there was a little bit of intonation in measure 13 that we need to clean up. Or right. it wasn't right along with the click, you know, make sure that your, uh, your time is better. Um, or whatever, it could be something for some other reason. We had a technical difficulty. Or we, we, that was really good, we loved it, we just want another one just like it so we have options. Right. It's called a safety. Um, we just like to know so we know that we're not wasting our lips. Okay, and keep morale up. Yeah, keep morale up, exactly. <laughs> okay. 10 takes of the same thing without telling us why and eventually we're just gonna be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Are you serious? <laughs> so we got some questions here from Twitter. Uh, why don't we go with this guy, his name is OmniScience. Uh, and his question is, can you name the single most expressive solo piece using your instrument, in your opinion? Wow, um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a very big question. Yeah. Uh, as far as solo literature is, is concerned, um, we are lucky that Mozart wrote four horn concertos for us, Beethoven wrote, um, wrote a uh, sonata, and Strauss wrote two horn concertos for us, Richard Strauss as mm. well as Franz Strauss. Um, so there are some really amazing uh, solo works for us. Well, I think one of, one of the most beautiful pieces uh, is the second movement of Strauss's second horn concerto. It's really hauntingly beautiful. And uh, so is the second movement of his first horn concerto. Those are, my, I think, my two favorite lyrical parts, but also in the orchestral literature, Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony. I mean, yeah. you know, we have, there's a pop tune with yeah. that in it. It was yeah. so beautiful, so. All right, one more question. One more Twitter question. This is from at Harp Jonah. Uh, this is, how many hours do you train per day? Uh, yeah, I guess it's really just the question. Uh, it looks like I might have a language <laughs> barrier there, but how many hours would you train a day? Um, well, for normal playing circumstances, I play, I at least play an hour a day. So mm -hmm. I make sure that in, in one hour, I go through all of my fundamentals. I play some long tones, I play some scales, play some arpeggios, I play some tongued stuff, I play some uh, slurs and some trills, and just to cover all of my bases of how to play the instrument. If I'm preparing for an audition with an orchestra, or if I have um, a solo coming up where I'm playing with an orchestra, uh, then I will definitely add another hour to two hours on, on top of that. So as a brass instrumentalist, I think we generally like to keep it around three hours at maximum, okay. maybe go to four, but above that, and it starts being diminishing returns because the facial muscles that we're working with are so small that it can only take so much effort. It's not like going to the gym and you know making your biceps bigger. We're not, you're not gonna see anybody with like a ripped face. Um, it's just sheet muscles, so right. it can only take so much. Gotcha, all right, well then, one more question then. This is from AK Digit. So then how would someone who wants to join the industry go about doing so, assuming, assuming they have the talent? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, for our industry, uh, you need to be really good at sight reading. Um, and okay. sight reading is everything because we don't get to look at the music before it's put on our stand. Uh, as you know, right. a lot of times it's being written during you know, the previous session, you're like still writing parts out or right. still making adjustments. So we have, and time is money, so you want it right the very first time and you want it right every time because mm -hmm. if you need to redo something for some other reason, you want to change a note and somebody makes a mistake, then you have to redo it again. So you have to be really good at sight reading, which is essentially learning how to sing. The other thing is um, you got to be nice. You can't, I mean, in an orchestra, you can win a job and you can get tenure and then you never have to be nice to anybody again. I'm not saying that orchestra people are generally jerks. Classical people. I'm not, I'm not saying people <laughs> in orchestras, but I'm saying you can get away with it. Yeah. But in the freelance world, you can't get away with 
being a jerk, people will yeah. just not hire you. They won't care how good you are at your instrument. If right. they don't like being around you, if they don't like hanging with you, then they're just not going to call you. So be fun, be cool, <laughs> play your instrument well, sight read well. Sight read. Yeah, and show up on time. Well, there you go. All right. Well, Dylan, thanks a lot. That was really uh, very informative Thank for me you. anyway. Um, well, there you go, Dylan Hart. Thank you. Uh, thanks Thank for you. joining us and thanks for watching. See you soon.